Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to start, you know, with this uh, new panel. And it's a great pleasure to chair this panel uh, that is going to be dedicated to the topic of monetary sovereignty. Uh, in the textbooks, as you know, uh, monetary sovereignty includes essentially three exclusive, exclusive rights for a given state. First, the right to issue currency, which is legal tender within its territory. Second, the right to determine and change the value of that currency. And third, the right to regulate the use of that currency or any other currency within its territory. The first and the third rights correspond to the role of, uh, of money as a medium of payment. The second right reflects the role of money as a unit of account. Monetary sovereignty implicitly encompasses rights to senior age rents uh, from money creation or the provision of liquidity as lender of last resort. More broadly, the concept of effective monetary sovereignty is the relevant one regarding the ability to govern money to achieve policy objectives. And more recently, the topic of monetary sovereignty is much more considered in the context of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Without uh, CBDCs, it could be argued that private and foreign digital monies could displace domestic currencies such as the euro, threatening the central bank's monetary policy and the lender of last resort capability. In fact, the digitalization of finance has broadened the available payment options. Fintech startups and big techs have entered the payment market. The crypto universe has boomed and burst. CBDCs would provide an anchor of stability for the monetary and payment system against possible disruptions. For the euro area, there could also be a strategic advantages to having a digital euro. As the world's largest single market, Europe cannot afford to remain passive while other jurisdictions move ahead. If other central bank digital currencies were allowed to be used more widely for, for cross-border payments, we could risk diminishing the attractiveness of the euro, currently the world's second most important currency after the US dollar. And the euro could become more exposed to competition from alternatives such as global stable coins. Ultimately, this could endanger our monetary sovereignty, the topic of this uh, session, and the stability of the European financial sector. We will touch upon this and other topics in our session with the three panelists with, that I will briefly introduce now. Our first speaker is uh, Mrs. Rhoda Wicks-Brown, General Counsel and Director of the, of the Legal Department at the IMF. She has lectured and written articles and IMF board papers on various aspects of law. Under her tenure, the, the IMF Legal Department has been shortlisted for two Financial Times Awards for innovation, strategic and risk advice, and most innovative in-house legal team in North America. Our second speaker is Ms. Jens Van Kloster, Assistant Professor of Political Economy at the University of Amsterdam. His research has a multidisciplinary orientation, ranging from governance of financial markets, climate change, macroprudential policy, and its interplay with monetary policy and banking supervision. And finally, but not least, this is Corinne Selber Gutnech. is Professor of Private Law and Economic Law in the University uh, of Basel. Her research covers cross-disciplinary issues between private and financial markets, market law, digitalization and its impact on public and private money, payment systems and the financial system at large. But uh, let's go to the, to the substance of today's uh, panel, uh, monetary sovereignty. So, you know, some housekeeping uh, instructions. Uh, I was told by Chiara, and I always, you know, follow the instructions of my legal counselor, eh? uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, exactly eh? to the point that each panelist has 15 minutes for the presentations in sequence. And afterwards, we'll open, you know, the floor for discussions. But theoretically, according to Chiara, we will have to finalize at 5.30. So, eh? let's start, and we can, we can start. So. Uh, let me give the floor to Ms. Wicks Brown. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you, Vice President Agendas, for that a very nice introduction. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, 
uh, and thanks for the fortitude in still being here when we're the last session of what has been a long couple of days of intense discussion. Um, I'm delighted to be on this panel to discuss monetary sovereignty. Frankly, I think it's an important topic. It's a little esoteric. It's one that I think we um, don't reflect on often enough in some ways. Um, as we see it, it's something of an evolving concept uh, and one on which there's not necessarily a unified view, as I think the, the panel will also bring out. Uh, one of our former general counsels almost two decades ago described monetary policy, at least the, the creation, uh, described the general point of monetary sovereignty, or at least the creation of it, as um, having something that has evolved through customary law, doctrinal sources, judicial decisions, and treaties, a body of international law has been developed that defines the contours of monetary sovereignty. So what's the point of that? The point just being that the concept has not been static, but there are certain key principles that I think have emerged over the, over the, the decades and, um, and that have been the, the, the source, and I cannot touch on that very briefly. At present, I also say that we're in the, an environment of rapid evolution that certainly could and likely will have important implications for monetary sovereignty, however one describes that concept. Uh, uh, VP um, Deguinders has already touched on some of these, but you know, key developments, including the widespread, and I would say this still increasing and still evolving, digitalization of payments and global globalization of finance more generally. That's key and that's been a big topic of discussion. But I'm also going to put on the table a couple of other developments that I think the jury is still out, as us lawyers would say in that respect. One of those, for example, is increasing geopolitical fragmentation. Um, it's early days yet. Um, we've had recent developments, such as the expansion of the BRICS group, for example. There is no IMF view on this, by the way, and to be clear, I'm not representing a view of the IMF, but I'm simply noting the vast commentary and some of the speculation that has already emerged as a result of these recent discussions as to future evolution of the international monetary system. And in that context, um, the, the, the way that monetary uh, sovereignty, as we know it, has, has operated. And then the third factor I would mention is kind of an old school one, as my teenagers would say, but it's just the sort of sticky and persistent inflation that we've seen over recent periods. Again, it remains to be seen, but I think if we're going to step back and take a big, a big look at these things, um, these are factors that that are interesting and that one looks again at monetary sovereignty i think warrant some some at least thought to keep in the back of the mind i'm going to just briefly touch on you know this tra the traditional definition that uh, mr deguinders has already reminded us of and then to highlight some challenges to monetary sovereignty and then share some key highlights of the imf's analytical work on these issues um just to give away the punchline at the very beginning I'm going to be very boring being the head of the IMF legal department because all of these, you know, exciting discussions of digitalization and CBDCs and the digital euro, I know that gets a lot of excitement. But when we step back at the IMF and look at all of these things, ultimately monetary sovereignty is about monetary credibility. It's about avoiding currency substitution and other things of that kind. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And the ultimate solution, the ultimate sort of defense that we advise our member countries to do in this respect is to strengthen monetary policy frameworks in that context to also strengthen fiscal frameworks and debt and look at issues around debt and so on because the confidence effects that oftentimes can corrode and take away from monetary sovereignty are addressed if you do those things and if you get them right. And conversely, if you have terrible policies, and if you have weak institutions, and if you have fiscal dominance, digitalization isn't going to solve that problem. A digital version of a really bad currency is not going to be any better than a bad currency, right? So I think it all comes down to fundamentals, monetary policy, fiscal policy, strong institutions, strong frameworks. That's the sort of broad thing, and I'll just sort of quickly um, try to emphasize a few, a few points in that respect. So again, no need for me to remind you of at least the traditional definition of monetary sovereignty. Again, our chair has already done that very nicely. The three key, um, the, the three key essential rights that we've always understood as being inherent in that concept. But I want to even to make the point that, again, it sounds very technical. It's the right to issue currency. It's the right to determine and change the value. It's, it's all about sovereign rights. I think what gets lost sometimes in this discussion of monetary sovereignty 
is that that has never been an absolute context, uh, an absolute concept in terms of the sort of dominance of that sovereignty. If you step back, think about, you know, I'm from the IMF. When countries join the IMF and virtually, I would say almost, it's a pretty universal membership. It's not every country, but it's mostly every country. When you join the IMF, you give up certain rights. Um, for example, uh, member countries of the IMF cannot impose exchange restrictions as they would like. There are firm rules in the Articles of Agreement about um, the extent to which um, you, can, you can impose exchange restrictions. Um, there are even uh, requirements um, in the Articles dealing with the conduct of exchange rate policies. Um, there are circumstances under which countries can be called upon to provide freely usable currencies or to provide SDRs upon the demand of the IMF. I could go on. The point just being there are a number of aspects of membership in institutions like the IMF that involve a voluntary relinquishment of some of that sovereignty. And so it's not this absolute context that I think a caricature of it can sometimes make it out to be. And it's not only the IMF, the OECD has codes. Um, on uh, invisible transactions on capital account that has similar requirements. The WTU has their statutes, um, the, the GATS and the General Agreement on Tariffs and, and Trade, again, similar kinds of, of um, restrictions on what would otherwise be an unfettered right of monetary policy. So the point just being, um, it's never been absolute. In the interest of a broader public good, countries have voluntarily given up some of the sovereignty um, and, and that's just an important point to, to keep in mind. And the issues I've just talked about, it can relate to international agreements. I've sort of given a few of them. I also want to make the point that also very important um, when you think about the concept of, of, of monetary sovereignty is also developments at the national level and in a country-specific context. So, for example, a, pre, a country that can issue its own currency and make it attractive to its own population has a higher degree of monetary sovereignty as it retains control of that of this monetary policy and gives in that in turn gives the country the flexibility required to swiftly adapt to changing economic and financial conditions, including during times of crisis and to coordinate monetary and fiscal policy. Countries have therefore taken different approaches in this respect. Again, you probably all know this, but just to remind, um, some countries have a totally restrictive approach. I would say many of our IMF member countries, especially EMDEs, have this approach where the only sovereign currency that can be used in the territory is the currency of that member. Um, other countries have what we we'll call a more of an intermediate approach where any currency can be used to settle domestic monetary obligations, but the sovereign currency cannot be refused if it happens to be presented for payment. And again, that's the case in the UK and as I understand it in, in most of Europe. Um, there's a third less restrictive approach where any currency can be used to settle domestic monetary tr transactions and counterparties can even refuse to accept the sovereign currency itself. And again, the US is the classic example of that. Again, so the point just being that even within, when you think about the way that national laws treat these issues, there's a wide degree of, of divergence and very different approaches. Um, the one point I haven't touched on in this whole discussion is the effectiveness of all of these, again, regimes that I just talked about. Whether these restrictive frameworks are in fact effective is a totally different issue. And maybe that's a nice segue to the, the next point I wanted to touch on briefly, which is just some of the challenges and some of the risks um, related to monetary sovereignty. So be, beyond the, these legal considerations that I've just touched upon, <clears throat> excuse me, the ability of a state to defend its the privileged role of its domestic currency and to control and to limit the use of that currency has been challenging, again, in particular for EMDEs, but not only for emerging markets and developing economies. Um, so just to list a few of these challenges. Again, the obvious one, the one we talk about the most, the one we all worry about the most, is currency substitution. It typically occurs against the backdrop of unsound domestic macroeconomic policies and a lack of trust in policy institutions. Um, times of high and volatile inflation undermines the ability of the domestic currency to function as a stable source of value. In more extreme cases, including hyperinflation, we've seen that households and firms will typically aim to minimize exposure to the rapidly depreciating currency and prefer to switch from that unit of account. The domestic currency's medium of exchange and unit of account functions in that case become encumbered. And, in, and the risk of currency substitution rises even further 
in cases where there are limited hurdles to foreign exchange convertibility, where you have government guarantees on uh, foreign denominated liabilities, where you have low foreign exchange transaction costs, where there's an absence of regulatory limits on foreign exchange exposure for banks and corporates. So again, not a new phenomenon, but it's a very important phenomenon that, um, that impacts monetary uh, sovereignty. The phenomenon is new, but of course what is new now is the, the, the new forms of digital private and public monies, um, everything ranging from cryptocurrencies to stable coins to CBDCs, and the impact that these can have in terms of accelerating and facilitating monetary uh, uh, um, uh, currency substitution. The rise of digital money could intensify currency competition, providing new options and further incentives um, for currency substitution. Moreover, certain attributes of some of these digital monies, not all of them, but some of them also has the potential to displace domestic currencies. Attributes including things like lower transaction costs, ease of access, the potential to provide beneficial entry into a wider platform of services. That was the big thing with Libra, of course, as we all know, and that's what caused the consternation that it did among us in the official sector. But that already exists in other places. There are, there are payment services in China, for example, WeChat Pay that integrates the transfer of electronic money with its rather ubiquitous uh, social media services that anyone who visits China is aware of. There's also Alipay that sort of links its e-money to China's largest online retail site. So again, these, these things already exist, maybe not as widespread as would have been the case had the official sector not been there, but these are very significant um, factors. I touched at the top on geopolitical fragmentation, and again, there's not much more to say about that, but I think it is something that is worth keeping an eye on when one steps back and look at broader trends that can impact um, sovereignty. On the other side of the coin, I just want to, to, to note that a few countries, fortunately only a few so far, but have gone to the other extreme in terms of basically adopting a privately issued um, money as local currency and as uh, legal tender, um, giving, so giving legal tender status um, to local, to, to basically crypto assets. This happened in the Central African Republic, but they've already repealed, um, passed legislation to repeal that. And the other country, of course, is El Salvador, the Chivo uh, wallet in El Salvador, which is a government managed wallet, but, um, and, and that relies upon cryptocurrency. The IMF has been very clear in terms of our own warning that official currency or legal tender status should not be given to crypto assets, that it poses fundamental macroeconomic risks, including risks to the effectiveness of monetary policy, um, as well as capital flow volatility, unstable domestic prices, and fiscal risks. Um, this also raises serious concerns about financial stability, financial integrity. Much of this is pseudo, the pseudonyms and pseudoisms that are part of that framework that raises important financial integrity concerns. Of course, there's legal risks that can flow from the classification or misclassification or non-classification in some cases of these um, crypto assets, consumer protection, market integrity. Again, I could go on. I think in this audience, I don't need to make the case for why it's pro it can be very tricky to have crypto assets as legal tender. But again, I think that's, um, um, we're still keeping an eye on that. Um, the fund has certainly been clear again in terms of our guidance and we had issued a paper in early 23 on that issue. So I'm just gonna conclude very quickly. I think I'm still within my time uh, period, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so just by touching a little bit on some of the IMF's work and advice on these issues, I've already alluded to some of it. Um, we know that um, central banks are continuing to explore mechanisms to enhance monetary sovereignty, to enhance the effectiveness of monetary policy transmission channels, including a big focus on central bank digital currencies. I know the digital euro always elicits a lot of excitement when that is discussed, so I'm not going to say anything about that. I'll leave it for other panelists. But, um, but this general idea of looking at CBDCs as um, both a way to address some of these concerns about con uh, substitution, but also as a broader policy device. There's certainly a lot of discussions of that ongoing. Just at the fund, we've given uh, technical assistance, capacity building assistance to over 48 of our member, member countries so far that have been interested in the issuance of CBDCs. It really varies from country to country what is motivating that interest. For some countries, um, our members in the Eastern Caribbean, for example, it's as basic as having 
cash because sometimes when there's hurricanes and those kinds of things, you just can't transport cash. You can't, you know, it just doesn't work. So a lot of the interest in the sand dollar and in the, the Eastern Caribbean region in particular is, um, is driven by that. Um, and, and again, it really, there's, there's lots of issues around financial inclusion in some of the poorer countries. There's issues around just access to, to a means of payment that doesn't sort of have some of the costs associated with it. So again, really a wide range have been of, of, of considerations have been, have been driving that. Um, we've included digital money as a key priority, and IMF staff, again, have been working actively on these issues. We've also recently published the first guidance from the IMF on capacity development work related to, to CBDCs. Um, and, so, and so that work continues. Again, I'll mention the example of Brazil, for example. Juliana was just on the, the previous panel, but Brazil is one country that we think is doing an interesting. So the, the central bank is in the process right now of developing a CBDC that will circulate alongside tokenized assets in a regulated DLT platform. Again, the, the emphasis in that context is not on uh, again, uh, currency substitution and those concerns is more on the use of innovative technologies to, pro to promote the development of new business models and online applications in an ecosystem where CBDCs will serve as a means of payment. And so the national currency might become more attractive if this digital version is successful in making financial services more efficient and more accessible. But again, that is certainly not the, the, the primary goal of that. And again, there's, there's other examples of that. I would just conclude by noting that taking together carefully, these careful design and policy considerations will underpin trust in CBDCs, but this trust must be anchored in an autonomous central bank with credibility in delivering on its mandate. It's kind of the point I made at the start. It goes back to the fundamentals. A key part of our work in this area is kind of boring, but it's to emphasize the importance of credible institutional frameworks and that these are the first line of defense to protect against monetary, to protect monetary sovereignty and stability. There are certain key features of these kinds of frameworks that enhance trust in, the, in monetary policies, including transparency, coherence, strong legal foundations for the independence and the accountability of the central bank, and so on. I would also note that it's not just about monetary policy, it's also about fiscal frameworks. Strong fiscal frameworks can play a key role in safeguarding monetary sovereignty, especially when monetary policy frameworks are weak. And again, we see that in a number of countries. Avoiding large deficits and high debt levels also protect monetary sovereignty, especially in the context, again, of weak monetary policy frameworks. In countries where fiscal deficits are large and you have high debt levels, governments are more likely to put pressure on the central bank to provide monetary financing and to avoid tightening monetary policy in order to avoid raising the cost of sovereign borrowing. And so again, the potential negative feedback loop in those kinds of cases between monetary and fiscal policies should be addressed, again, by enhancing monetary policy frameworks to avoid the inflationary consequences of fiscal dominance, um, which um, consequences, of course, just put further pressure on currency, increases currency substitution, puts further pressure on monetary sovereignty, and is completely counter, uh, counterproductive. So that made the point earlier that bolstering monetary sovereignty is a policy goal, and some are issuing CBDCs to address that goal. We don't see it as a very efficient solution for the reasons that I, I, I noted earlier. It's not going to fundament, to change the fundamentals, and ultimately that's what we have seen as um, as making a difference. So to conclude, the exclusive legal rights of the sovereign state to issue, regulate, and determine the value of its currency, those are well established. Um, in practice, some states do have significant challenges to defend the privileged role that, you know, we've sort of the traditional understanding of um, monetary sovereignty presents um, in terms of protecting, protecting its own domestic currency. The rise and the, of the digitalization of finance, financial globalization, all of these give rise to questions as to whether a new conceptualization is needed for monetary uh, sovereignty. Again, as I said, we continue to stick with the traditional, but I know that 
my, some of my fellow panelists will, will probably touch on that issue a little bit more. Again, our view ultimately is that however you define the concept, again, those basics are what we need to focus on, at least that many of the countries that deal, we deal with, that's what makes a difference ultimately, not the conceptual definition, but what they're doing with respect to these very critical policy frameworks that ultimately determine whether you have monetary sovereignty or you don't. And so I'll stop right there. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roda. Thank you very much for stressing the importance of credibility for monetary sovereignty and credibility is based on uh, strong institutions and uh, correct and right uh, policies. Uh, you have almost fully respected as well, you know, the timeline, the time limit that we that we had. And I suppose that Jens is going to follow suit in terms of, uh, of that. So now, uh, you know, is your turn, uh, Jens. Thank you. you. The floor. Thank you. Um, I have slides. Um, first, thanks a lot to the organizers, to Kaya. I'm really happy to be there. It was really a pleasure the past uh, two, two days, all the discussions. Um, in my uh, talk, I want to indeed um, start off from a paper I wrote with uh, Stefan Murau uh, that came out last year in which we uh, look at this notion of monetary sovereignty. And uh, the uh, uh, starting point we have is not so much the legal notion of monetary sovereignty, but this sort of widespread notion where a state has monetary sovereignty if it issues its national currency, if it can control that currency. And we also talk about the sort of vision of the monetary system in that, that notion of sovereignty where currencies are little islands, where jurisdictions and currencies largely uh, overlap and where the ability to domestically regulate currency really affords states with an incredibly powerful uh, prerogative. And if, if you use that notion of sovereignty, then to join the euro is to give up monetary sovereignty, right? You, you join the euro, you've given up your ability to regulate your own currency. And in that sense, a, a currency union is really only a loss. Um, but that is actually one of the considerations we use to suggest that that's actually not such an appropriate way to think about uh, monetary policy, uh, monetary sovereignty. And in the uh, paper, basically, we make the case on the empirics that that notion of sovereignty just doesn't fit the real world as it exists today, certainly not the uh, global financial system as it's taken shape after the 1970s, just on a very basic level, uh, states don't control the issuance of money. Central banks and particularly also private financial institutions, banks, but also a whole range of, of further uh, economic actors. Um, and also um, when we then look at the, the phenomenon of uh, financial globalization, we see a number of core currencies which are very, very widely used uh, and other currencies much less so, and specifically also money creation in core currencies, specifically the dollar happening outside the US, happening more outside the US by some metrics than, than in the US. And that's our uh, argument for them proposing that really for the sort of monetary system that we have today, this notion of effective monetary sovereignty is much more appropriate, provides us with a much better way to reflect on the financial system and, and financial policy. Okay, so that, that's the paper, and then I, for the um, uh, invitation to speak here, I thought it would be interesting to pick up that line about the euro a bit more and look at that in, in more detail. So the, the question I, I, I want to ask is whether uh, the euro, and particularly euro internationalization, has indeed contributed to effective monetary sovereignty, how the ECB has related to that set of objectives and uh, to that end also uh, start with a, a somewhat larger historical perspective on the international role of the euro, where I think also these notions of sovereignty come up at different moments. And then I want to fast forward and say something about the new strategy. So from 2019, also already the ECB has taken a much more uh, active attitude towards internationalization of the uh, euro and um, building on a 
paper that came out last month we wrote with Serena Grunewald. We we're very enthusiastic about the new ECB monetary policy strategy. I want to suggest that that strategy really provides a lot of resources to think about internationalization. Okay, so, uh, so this short history, short history of the euro, uh, that of course starts with Tommaso Padua Schioppa. And I think this is really within the process of creation of the euro, the uh, central banker who really strongly emphasizes this perspective of effective monetary sovereignty. At the European Commission, he sets out in a lot of detail that in actual fact, already the member states of the uh, EU have lost a lot of ability to use their national currencies effectively for monetary policy. He criticizes uh, at the time monetarist visions of national sovereignty based on flexible exchange rates and argues that that notion really doesn't apply, that national currencies only provide limited autonomy to macroeconomic policies, and that exactly through monetary integration by uh, sharing the creation of money collectively, states can have better external internal uh, monetary stability, can do collective decision making, so no longer a monetary policy that is de facto set by the German Bundesbank, and also this idea that this might be a strong counterweight against the dollar, against the background of the very volatile dollar in the 70s and the uh, 80s. So I think here, at this point in monetary integration, this notion of effective sovereignty is very prominent. Um, but then when we fast forward to the, uh, the actual creation of the euro, you immediately see a, a much more reluctant attitude to that international role. Uh, this is uh, the very first speech, very famous speech that Wim Duisenberg gave to a, uh, a, a Euro European American community meeting at the Dutch Central Bank early January, where he started off with this very powerful statement the euro has arrived, the ECB has taken up the reins of monetary sovereignty uh, in the eurozone, but then went on to set out quite a skeptical approach towards internationalization, arguing that yes, there are clearly benefits, the US exorbitant privilege of um, being able to fund uh, external imbalances in this way, but also clear, clear uh, disadvantages um, pertaining to volatile capital, more volatile capital flows, and it, uh, uh, more uh, difficult to follow monetary aggregates. And there, I think you really feel the air, like from the Bundesbank, still it's very sh much shaping the thinking. And on on that basis, Yargo, it's really the appropriate attitude for us. This is economic policy is neutrality, and uh, in addition to that, also relying on markets to decide the international role of the euro, not something that the ECB would take uh, action on. Okay, now that of course um, then also goes together with a period in which the euro, looking at different metrics, really doesn't take off in the way that it would be a replacement of the dollar. Uh, in this graph, you see the black line introduction of the euro. Before the black line, you see the uh, share of foreign exchange turnover of the Daymark. After the black line, you see the euro. There's not really a break there in, in the international role. Uh, similarly, currency composition of central bank reserves. This also includes uh, Dutch, French uh, currency reserves, but again, a very similar picture emerging uh, with not that big a break with the introduction of the euro. So in, at least in that on that metric, that internationalization of the euro doesn't uh, take up. And um, I think that is also in various ways quite directly related. Ah, sorry, this, these are the foreign currency reserves. Um, so you see here, very similar picture, introduction of the euro, not a big break with the uh, period before that. A key reason for this, uh, I think um, we can we can argue about this, and I think here it ties in very nicely with Rhoda's argument, is uh, fiscal monetary frameworks, uh, in the case of the Eurozone, specifically the uh, issue of spreads, the um, absence of a uh, widely available euro-denominated safe asset. Um, 
as one of the key reasons for the euro punching below its weight. If you look at the importance of the euro in the global economy, uh, that uh, comparison to the dollar is just, just striking. Um, and here, I guess there's, there's a lot of things we could focus on. In my own research, uh, I think uh, one, what I take to be really a core episode that we often neglect in this story, but I think that also, again, illustrates very well this earlier attitude, is the 2005 decision to uh, impose um, a, for, uh, a private credit rating requirement on sovereign debt for the purposes of determining eligibility in the ECB collateral framework. Okay. Very technical issue, also at the time not uh, very much decided, but at this point the decision is made to rely on external providers to uh, navigate this very tricky issue of dealing with uh, sovereign debt in the ECB policy framework. And uh, Florian Schuster, I think, has very recently very nicely showed that the spreads really emerge with that decision. So before the Eurozone crisis, already from that attitude of neutrality, the, uh, the comparability of different uh, safe uh, sovereign debt is uh, compromised. And then that's, of course, very vastly exacerbated by the uh, Eurozone crisis. But I think here there's a very direct line from this attitude of neutrality to the uh, weakened status of the um, uh, Euro. Um, some people have argued that this was a punish policy about punishing profligate member states. Uh, I think that's just from uh, my attempts to interview everyone involved in this debate and talk with everyone there. It's just not true. Uh, this was really about avoiding that decision and, and taking a an, uh, position of neutrality in relation to sovereign debt. Okay. Um, and it's uh, interestingly enough, already in the uh, late 90s, this was all debated at the European Monetary Institute. Um, and uh, what we see uh, here is a fax that the German Bundesbank sent to the European Monetary Institute uh, in 1997, already laying out some of the key objections against this minimum credit rating requirement, again invoking this notion of sovereignty. Uh, the transfer of decision-making to a very small number of private profit-oriented rating agencies, uh, the ECB would lose its sovereignty in the eligibility procedure, at least partly, not even a minor level of discretionary decision-making would remain with the ECB. So this idea by moving to relying on external credit ratings, you give up something of the sovereignty of, of the euro and thereby uh, weaken its international uh, role, you might add. Uh, okay, so to summarize, this is the early history. Um, with Padua Schioppa, you see this uh, idea that member states can acquire monetary, effective monetary sovereignty by transferring Westphalian monetary sovereignties to a supranational European Central Bank. But then, and, and we can go into much more details for all this, uh, the reasons for this, a central bank very reluctant to exercise that sovereignty and focus very much on the domestic objective of price stability. Okay, now I think that uh, makes the new strategy so interesting because it provides space for thinking much more in a much more nuanced way about uh, these further economic policy objectives that are always at play in making uh, monetary policy. And that could therefore, I think, also be a very powerful resource for thinking about the international role of the euro. Um, the um, uh, uh, Again, going to the uh, paper, let me just sketch some of these considerations. And I think in this sense, it's not surprising that this re-evaluation of the international role of the euro so directly precedes the start of the review of the monetary policy strategy, right? To my mind, at least, these are very similar uh, developments. And this 2021 uh, strategy really um, 
uh, follows on this revaluation of internationalization, uh, not just uh, a primary objective, right? If you look at the 2003 strategy, very narrow conception also of that primary objective in terms of 2% inflation on a uh, two to five year time horizon, but also secondary objectives, considerations, priorities, more prominent, uh, different ways of discussing these side effects. Um, in that context also is Belsenabel's qualification of the principle of market neutrality. And as we argue in the paper, uh, but also already implicitly in the past years, particularly starting with the OMT decision, more coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. And I think this is also the right way forward for internationalization, right? This is clearly not something that the ECB can completely devise by itself, but there are choices to be made here. And I think in this regard, also Wim Duisenberg's observation that there are benefits and, and, and risks has, I think, a very important message, right? There are real choices in how you internationalize. Not all internationalization is desirable. And there are, if you really want to, as uh, Panetta put it, uh, unleash the Euro's uh, uh, untapped potential at the global level, then you need to think about these constitutional uh, dimensions. Okay, now, uh, also a bit in the spirit of the uh, monetary sovereignty paper, I want to look a bit more at private money creation and the ways in which a more active approach there could help help support the broader economic policy objectives. The first is about what's known as the exorbitant duty. If you have an international currency, you also acquire a certain level of responsibility for the broader financial system that the US has struggled with. Uh, the EU today still a de facto multi-currency uh, polity. Uh, but a, a very heterogeneous set of arrangements for providing liquidity support for offshore euro creation. Here, I think a lot could be standardized, more clear, more credible, and that would, I think, vastly uh, push the international role of the euro. Let me move to what I think is the more exciting big picture vision of what internationalization could look like. I think throughout history, you see this very tight connection between, on the one hand, international currencies and on the other hand, energies, going back to uh, the Netherlands and peat on some historical accounts. You see international currencies rising with new energy sources. And of course, the dollar is very, very closely intertwined with fossil fuels. Uh, the offshore dollar system, as we know it today, originated in petrodollar recycling. Uh, the reason why we get all these uh, oil import invoiced in dollars is because of the oil investment being invoiced in dollars. There's just a, I think, very important link there, which in the context of euro internalization you could look at and think about the euro as the currency of clean energy, right? So specifically on the one hand, a um, supervisory framework, on the other hand, maybe also a monetary policy framework that would be much more supportive for clean energy would also pave the way for a more international role of the euro as a uh, international currency of clean energy. Okay, I will uh, conclude. Um, achieving effective monetary sovereignty uh, I think really the way to think about that is uh, monetary sovereignty as achieving policy objectives by governing money, right? Not just uh, uh, central bank money, but particularly also all these different forms of private credit money, offshore uh, money. And I think to summarize, uh, today the euro can really become a powerful tool for achieving the EU's economic policy objectives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jens, for the, you know this reference to the international role of the of the of the of the euro. But perhaps you know we'll have to look at uh, as well you know the the real economy part of the European economy, you know, and uh, you know how you know that compares with the US and other parts of the of the of the of the world. Uh, so we need to, to have you know a holistic approach with respect to the the role that uh, the euro is going to play in international markets. And now, finally, Corinne, huh? the floor is yours. Hmm? Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my task to discuss whether maintaining monetary sovereignty, as we've just 
heard about, is a rationale for uh, the introduction of a digital currency issued by central banks, so CBDCs. For obvious reasons, the answer depends on the understanding of monetary sovereignty itself, and I will base my considerations gladly on what we've just heard uh, so far um, from the chair and from my co-panelists. However, I will also have in mind this concept of effective monetary policy primarily, because it, I, I really enjoyed reading your paper and it convinced me so that as a starter. So accordingly, according to effective monetary policy, we would say that a state is and remains um, monetarily sovereign when it has the positive power, when it has the normative, so the value-based duty, but also the efficient ability to uh, directly achieve monetary policy goals and indirectly contribute to further economic goals, uh, of which we have heard a lot today as well. And this all, that's the important part, through discretionary, so through freely taken decisions and actions. Now, such instruments for actions, of course, obviously, are legislation, regulation, and followed by supervision, etc. But in the monetary field, these tools encompass, in particular, also, of course, monetary policy. Um, and as a last resort, but very undesired, of course, financial backstops. Another very powerful instrument, however, is anchoring. And I would like to explain that a little bit more. As we all know, the market is very agile when it find, and it finds its way around regulations that impede too much its activities. In such a situation, however, the state can, instead of simply adding more regulation, decide to offer a good or a service on its own. And by doing so, it sets a minimum standard that private providers cannot go below because otherwise the public would no longer use those markets solution, but the state's one. As a result, anchoring ensures access to essential public goods and services while disciplining the market. And hence, it is an effective, a really powerful complement to regulation. Ideally, it prevents market participants also from pushing the state into a situation where a financial backstop becomes unavoidable. To be clear, we must not confuse anchoring with the exclusive provision of a public good or service by the state. Rather, anchoring is suitable in situations where a market may very well exist, however, where it is somehow inefficient for for example, because of exorbitant rent extraction for exorbitant risk taking and the like. So, and in addition, where regulation alone has repeatedly failed to address such an issue. So this would be a, a complement to regulation. With that in mind, then, I would now look at some situations where um, monetary goals, and among them, uh, after all, um, a, a smooth settlement of payments, is not efficiently achieved. And by definition, then, monetary sovereignty could be at risk. And then I will see whether a CBDC could improve the state's capacity to, in, to accomplish that goal. For obvious reasons, I'll do this mostly from the perspective of the European system. And I'll start with an international aspect and then um, move back to domestic and pan-European challenges. Many of the existing systems for cross-border payments are based on correspondent banking, yet correspondent banking is in crisis, we all know. Um, the crisis puts strain on international trade flows and cross-border businesses in general, and the retail sector, especially remittances, is even more inefficient. Today, if time is of, es of essence, to my personal experience, tech-savvy actors, and this relates to businesses as well as to individuals, pay with US dollar coins, for example, or with Tether. You buy a stable coin, you transfer it, you receive it, you reconvert it, done. So in these cases, stable coins serve as a conduit for quick payment. Although, and not, not as a kind of a euro dollar holding or something. Although the problem have been known for a long time, states obviously cannot solve on these problems on their own. Otherwise they would have done already. And this leads us back to efficient monetary sovereignty, because um, this concept implies also 
Situations where constraints prevent autonomous achievement of goals, the then sovereignty inherently is bound to be shared. That's the idea. So it has to be exercised jointly as a cooperative sovereignty. And we've just heard of the monetary union, as we all know, that's an example. However, this, this cooperative sovereignty comes with a huge, with an essential caveat, as it is only permissible to promote shared values of the states involved. Now, as a principle, these shared values, I'm not talking about the high ranking world peace, but rather on operational share, um, uh, shared values, such as a smooth pet settlement, we would agree that this could be a shared value for all the states. However, already when it comes to uh, impacts um, of, of uh, cross-border or cross currency payments in a free flow, so these impacts that it could uh, show on exchange rates, for example, values start to deviate, of course. So for this reason, collaborative projects such as the Enbridge, for example, in the wholesale um, sector, or icebreaker in the retail sector between BIS innovation hubs and national central banks are um, of great value. They explore how to safeguard, on the one hand, domestic interests, while nonetheless, on the other hand, central banks involved could establish with joint efforts what I've just described at the beginning, um, access to essential public goods and services. In this case, this would be possibility to conduct cross-border and cross-currency payments at a decent price in a reasonable time. It's interesting to observe that CBDCs used for cross-border payments need not necessarily be money. That might sound like something surprising. But I guess that at least in the beginning, CBDC for cross-border use will not be designed in a classical way as we understand money comprising function of payment as well as a, sto a store of value function. Let us step back briefly and let's look at the waterfall and the reserve waterfall solution that is planned for the digital euro. So if a payment is initiated and it surpasses a defined holding limit of the payee, then automatically this triggers a transfer to the payee's private account, bank or whatever. And the reverse waterfall then means that if a payment exceeds the holding limits of the payer, Again, automatically, this triggers a payment directly from his private account. And now we go back to cross-border constellations where we could set this holding limit to zero. And as such, CBDC would not be money, as I understand it at least, but it would be a pure conduit to initiate and execute payments from a domestic bank account to a foreign bank account. And in the remittance area, one could even uh, imagine from domestic cash to foreign cash. So my point here is that the state, or more precisely several states, can offer a basic service which is not intended to drive out private cross-border and cross-currency solutions, but rather to lead them to accommodate better to the, use, to the user's need. With that, I move to the domestic and the pan-European sphere. Several existing or potential future shortcomings in the monetary field have been highlighted, uh, in particular in the assessment report of the European Commission regarding the proposal of the uh, digital euro, and I would just mention three of them. So one would be outside competition by a foreign CBDC or a global stablecoin, as has been mentioned by um, Wix Brown as well, which comes along with a digital superiority, or which promises access to a uh, uh, very promising ecosystem, for example, as was the Libra case. So that could be one case. A second would be, or is, actually is, the dominance of international card schemes in the field of card payment, and accordingly the lack of competition from pan-European players. And the last, not least, but last, is the use of cash, which has been in decline, quite for some time, and is no longer able to meet all the needs and the future habits of its users. So, considering time, I will just briefly discuss cash, because this is the most evident area of action for a CBDC to complement cash. Um, by issuing cash, the central bank ensures basic supply of easily accessible, credit-risk-free money. In addition, bank deposits and all other private money 
is generally structured as a claim, claim payable at site and at par in public money. And this concept of full convertibility ensures the singleness of all the monies denominated in the same currency unit, be it private or public. And very obvious, central bank money and cash in particular so far serve as an anchor for private money. So it's about anchoring again. I first referred to the anchor function of cash in the research report I wrote with my esteemed colleague Serena Grunewald, which was already mentioned by Jens, and um, Benjamin Geva in uh, 2020. This report was commissioned by the ECB Legal Research Programme. And in 21, we published a paper which detailed in more precisely this uh, idea of, of anchoring in September. And then in November, um, Executive Board Member Fabio Panetta came out and prominently discussed the function of CBDC as a monetary anchor and a rational for the digital euro as, um, and now recently the assessment report I just mentioned, mentioned the anchor function no less than 30 times and as the first specific goal to achieve, um, to be achieved through a digital euro. So it's not negligible as an idea. However, what neither the speech nor uh, this assessment report has mentioned or any other publication I've seen so far is that there is a huge difference, apparently, between the anchor function as we have understood it and the anchor function as it is planned to be implemented with a digital euro. Um, Article 16 of the proposed draft will allow for holding limits, and uh, which is not mentioned there, but which comes along with it that for example, a waterfall solution could be um, complementing these uh, limits. I understand the idea, of course. It's preserved the financial stability of banks, because banks, especially in times of uncertainty, could experience considerable outflows of uh, deposits. But the point I want to make is that public money that does not allow full unlimited convertibility is not an efficient anchor. So. We, we face some kind of a problem because the, the existing anchor is losing some of its importance and its use. And the anchor to be is, in my opinion, to be a bit provocative, not yet designed in a, in a full-fledged way that it can serve the purpose. My second point is that the banking system, who has obviously to be protected here, seems to be too fragile for a digital euro, for a full accessible digital euro. And we have to think about that as well, whether it is the time already to introduce the digital euro now. And the third and last point concerns the draft proposal on the legal status of cash, which comes along and which accompanies um, the digital status of uh, the digital euro, uh, the status of the digital euro. And here I see that the mandatory ex acceptance that shall be introduced for digital euros goes much further than the mandatory acceptance for the cash. So what is more, the process of ensuring access to cash, that is also foreseen in order to not have it phased out, which is important, is incredibly cumbersome to my perception. And it is slow. Yes, thanks. Um, you have this observation of national authorities, potential introduction of flanking measures. Then you have an examination by the latter through the European Commission, you have consultation with the ECB, that takes time. And as you may well know, um, in the monetary fields, uh, network effects, positive as well as negative, play out very quickly, so it could be too late at a certain stage for the cash. So I sum up. The digital euro as it is planned may not be able to fully serve the anchor function of which the assessment report speaks. And we have to reconsider that and, and keep it in mind whether this, and, and it, on top of this, it might also in some ways facilitate the phasing out of cash. We have to keep that in mind and we have to reconsider how this um, uh, is in line with what Article 128 of the uh, Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. I conclude. It is important to acknowledge that with CBDC, as well as with conventional public money, only few economic objectives can be accomplished directly. That's not a direct tool. But where it is possible is with anchoring. And this is a very powerful instrument 
in this regard. In particular, public money should be understood as an anchor and designed accordingly. And as such, it should neither subsidize nor dominate the market, but discipline it through its minimum standard, thus forming a sustainable and inclusive basis for the functioning of a fair market economy. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Corinne. Uh, I understand perfectly how attractive it is to talk about uh, the digital euro, CBDCs, uh, stable coins, but, you know, the topic was uh, monetary sovereignty. So I, I'm going to take advantage of my position as uh, moderator of this panel to ask you one question. Um, it's about monetary sovereignty in the euro area. Well, the euro area, we are, uh, you know, we, we are not, uh, you know, a political union, even we are not a complete monetary union, even we, we are not uh, a complete banking union because we do not have this. So do you think that, uh, you know, this situation, you know, really has any sort of impact on the perception about um, the monetary sovereignty in the euro area? So I will start with Roda, and we will follow, you know, the order of the interventions. Well, as the as the representative of the IMF and the sort of non-European in the room, it's um, this is tricky. I mean, if you step back to what monetary sovereignty is, like I'm just going back to the sort of textbook definition, you know, the three rights that you summarized at the top. Um, again, just stepping back, and I'm just. Uh, there's not in itself a sort of necessary sort of urgency to protect monetary sovereignty as such with respect to the euro, right? At least not as not not as I understand it. Um, the zone is strong. Um, you're not one of those sort of the countries that we deal with that have the sort of currency substitution and other issues that I talked about earlier. Um, there are, of course, other goals for which this may be um you know desirable but i'm just going back to our narrow academic position and again i'm not espousing here the imf's view on these issues there may be a broader set of considerations but i'm just saying from purely that perspective um if you step back the urgency would not seem to be there but nonetheless obviously it's not just that narrow definition that controls any sort of circumstances and my sense is there's a broader set of public policy goals including some of which isabel just articulated and those are really Ultimately, not so much, I think, economic and financial decisions, but I think some of them are sort of broader public policy decisions that need to be made by the policymakers. Yeah. Jens? Um, yeah, I want to again completely agree with the point you uh, made on this, that I guess what I thought was in some ways very interesting in this observation of Duisenberg, that internationalization isn't always desirable. And I think that also true with regard to the international repercussions of internationalization right and that comes out in this notion of exorbitant uh, duty i think that comes out very clearly in widespread use of euros uh, within the eu outside the eurozone but that's of course also something to think about more globally so it's also not clearly in the interest of the eu if widespread use of euros outside the eu destabilizes the uh, states in ways that we have seen happen with dollarization, right? So I think there also there's, I think, beyond monitoring as currently happens in the internationalization of the euro reports, the spread of the uh, euros also really being very vigilant on ways in which in some ways expanding the euros uh, international role might end of the day not really help achieve the EU's uh, objectives either. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I wouldn't um, have a different opinion from what you have said, and I would add to that that um, the internationalization of uh, of the euro um, has to be there has to be a differentiation between um, several aspects. So when it comes to just um, small economies in the neighborhood of the euro area, there I, I see great potential. And this can be driven further, whereas the geopolitical uh, problems that you have just addressed, these are not um, 
challenges that can be overcome with a uh, internationalization of, of 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 a currency and the third thing which seems interesting to me is the most important trading partners of the european union are most likely to establish their own sorry come back to the digital currency as well again but they, they they're going to establish them as well so it will be rather about um interoperability um finding a coordinated um way forward and not kind of a dominance of the international role of the euro. Okay, thank you very much. But, uh, you know, I suppose that you will agree with me that uh, the life of a central bank of a monetary union is much more difficult. <laughs> you know, the job of, uh, you know, a central bank of a political union with a complete uh, 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 fiscal and uh, monetary and banking and banking union. Well, uh, you know, something that uh, you know, I do not want to, to 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 elaborate much more on that. But I think that is a real conclusion because you have, uh, you know, for instance, you know, twenty member states with different uh, economic and financial structures, and uh, these kind of things. Uh, I think that is quite obvious that uh, well, sometimes, you know, to take decisions, uh, you know, in a bank of a monetary union is uh, something that is a little bit more complex than in, in other in other circumstances. So I think that we have time, you know, for a couple of questions from from the audience. I see a lady there. Um, there. Hmm? Okay. Hmm? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for. Okay. Caroline Kleiner, uh, professor at the University Paris Cité. I thank you very much for the for the debate, uh, which is a topic I'm following for more than fifteen years. Um, I would like to make some uh, two remarks very short. Uh, the first one is that I think it's better for the understanding of the debate of monetary sovereignty, whether we distinguish uh, the between what is sovereignty and what is competence. Because in international law, states have competence given by international law. International law uh, recognizes to states a certain competence and uh, it does recognize a monetary competence. And then whether or not the state exercises itself this competence is another question. But it cannot relinquish, in my opinion, this is what I wrote 15 years ago, it cannot relinquish to its uh, own sovereignty. It's not possible because the state is a state and will always have sovereignty. But it can relinquish to the exercise of the monetary competence. So that's two concepts that is a, a bit uh, I mean, different. And then I would like to, um, uh, about your uh, function of anchoring and, and the CBDC. I think that this notion of anchoring at the end is a little bit the same than trust. And, and trust is it really at the core of the notion of currency and so of monetary sovereignty. And it reminds me of uh, what has been written uh, more than one century ago by uh, Friedrich Knapp and the uh, Recurrenter Anschluss, uh, which is at, at the very beginning of the creation or the issuance of, of a currency, which is at the end just to give uh, trust to people to use this medium of exchange, which then ca can become a, a, a currency. So I think that we are uh, playing with a concept that's unknown, I mean, for centuries uh, we are just uh, forming them in different ways uh, but at the end uh, core concept are the competence and the trust thank you well, thank you very much i think that we can take another question and afterwards i will give you the floor i see back the last one okay thank you i'm susanna Caffar. i'm professor at Università del salento in italy I think uh, we can all agree on the fact that the dominance of a currency on international markets equals to power. And we saw this only uh, 10 days ago at the BRICS uh, final statement in South Africa when they declared clearly that they won't accept uh, for any longer, as they say, this dominance of the dollar. So I would like to, to know the opinion of, of the panelists and of the chair, if possible, about this, the, the, the real substance behind this statement and if this open up some space for eventually uh, an expansion of the space for the euro or, and this is more a question for Rhoda, if it's possible to imagine uh, an expansion and, uh, and a reform of the, 
of the notion of the special drawing rights as a sort of neutral uh, currency for international relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, James, Cory. Several topics that I think that are quite relevant. Uh, can elaborate no more than five minutes <laughs> for all three of us, or four of us. Um, okay. Well, on the <laughs> on the first one, on the the first question. I mean, this issue of competence versus sovereignty. It's kind of what I was trying to address at the beginning. Again, the I think of monetary sovereignty, and I love the effectiveness concept. By the way, so I don't think they're in contradiction. But it's sort of three rights, right? The right to the right to issue, the right to determine and change value, and the right to regulate the use of that currency. The point I was trying, I made in my earlier intervention was that in some ways, again, it's also an exercise of sovereignty to sort of have that right exercised by another sort of entity of which you are part. And so that was the point I made about members that joined the IMF. They've given up some of their right to, you know, to determine the value because we have restrictions in the articles and in some of those other statutes I, I mentioned. I don't think that's a tension. I think it's a sovereign right to do that. And so that's how that sovereign has chosen to define and exercise its monetary sovereignty. It's not an incompatibility at all. In fact, I was making the opposite argument that people usually sort of see that as being a tension and it's not. It's an exercise of sovereignty in itself. On the second question regarding the SDR, that's an easier one in some ways, because the SDR is so sui generis, at least as we know it now, right? It's this, um, it's a basket of currencies, the IMF sort of looks at which currencies are freely usable, freely, you know, widely used and traded. As you know, the renminbi was the last currency we added to the basket several years ago, and I guess it's like in 2015, 2016. If a new currency emerges that we determine is widely used and traded, in the principal um, reserve markets is widely used in, in international transactions, that currency would be eligible to be in the basket. It's a very tough standard and very few um, currencies have made that test so far. And so mere sort of statement that it might be a new currency doesn't determine it. I think it's too, it's too early to tell, right? The jury is still out. But certainly nothing precludes that if such a currency were to emerge. So I hope that answers your question. But um, I don't have a crystal ball that sees either a BRICS currency or see that currency at this point being in an SDR basket. But it's possible. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. James? Uh, yeah, I, I really agree with this notion that uh, an international currency is a source of power and i guess that allows me to to still maybe say um a bit more about louis i think very uh correct observation that the real issue here is the specific constitutional role of the um euro and uh, i guess with this international currency that was the hope you have this immense source of international power right and you could do things with it and then on the other hand somehow as europeans we haven't been able to really agree what to do with it and i think it's that's the tension in which also this choice for a neutral um approach is made i don't think you need like a strong form of federal integration to make more effective choices on this topic, right? So in the uh, piece with uh, Serena that I, I emphasized, um, we focus very much on coordination with regards specifically to the, uh, the further objectives alongside price stability, uh, also the things we discussed uh, yesterday, where also for the purposes of the international role for the euro, you could make much more choices, right? So if you say, okay, we want, the euro, we want to use this incredibly potentially strong currency for pushing clean energy globally, then of course that cannot be a decision that the ECB makes by itself. But I think there's a lot of scope for making these decisions without immediately moving to a, a European state on the model of the US, which I think very few people at this point want. Thank you very much. Yes. Last I'd like to uh, reply very briefly to um, what you said about trust and recurrent link, because I like that very much. Of course, I agree with you that this is not a new concept at all. It's just a new bot bottle for the old wine, um, but it's an important one. Um, it has worked in the past, and 
that is why I stressed on that point as well, because um, we have a very topical example. Um, 100 years ago, we had the hyperinflation in uh, Germany, as you all know, and they introduced an auxiliary money to overcome that. It was one of the measures and it never was legal tender, but it was widely accepted because the monetary policy linked to this um, renten mark was quite convincing. So the trust was not because it was kind of is issued by whoever, it, it was th the way it was designed, the way it was managed. Um, and this uh, was the trust, uh, the, the trust reason for for this uh, auxiliary money. So I, yeah, I, I I agree with you. Well, thank you very much to the three of uh, of uh, of you. Uh, I think that the question about uh, the BRICS is extremely interesting. I think that uh, is a clear a clear reflection of uh, the geopolitical tensions that we are going through. Uh, sovereignty is a polyedric concept, and perhaps you know monetary uh, sovereignty is one is a part of that uh, of that uh, polyedric, uh, much more complex uh, concept of uh, sovereignty, and that's why uh, if you have tensions at the geopolitical level, immediately you know this is going to be reflected in in different uh, in different aspects, and perhaps you know the question of uh, uh, the monetary sovereignty having a common currency. That is not only you know the case of the BRICS as well. We have seen some some uh, you know some proposals in the case of the Latin American uh, countries now with respect to have you know a common currency. Well, but I think that we have uh, dealt with not only uh, monetary sovereignty. We have dealt with with uh, the digital euro, the internationalization of the euro. And with other aspects, I think that, uh, you know, I think that our three speakers, they deserve a very clear applause. Thank you very much.